Guys, I promise I'm awake. Okay, no one thinks I'm funny. You guys are all sleeping too. Good morning, Calgary and friends. Oh, thank you. There we go. Would you stand if you're able? We're going to go into a time of worship. And then after worship, we're going to have some really exciting announcements to share with you. And uh, yeah, it's, hey, did you guys know that Jesus rose?
church. And I just believe I'm confident in my God and I'm confident that you're going to experience him today in a way that truly will change your life forever if you will let it. Deciding to follow Jesus has been the best decision I have ever made in my entire life. Beyond who I chose to marry, beyond my children, I love them all, but nobody has changed my life the way that Jesus Christ has. And so I just encourage you, just try again. If you're like, you know what, I've tried him in the past, it didn't work, he didn't come through for me, try again. Just keep talking. You don't have to have this life all figured out. Nobody in this room does. But if you lean into Jesus, he is already leaning into you. And he will do something in your life that truly, profoundly changes it. And so that's my little preach this morning that I didn't plan on doing. But I just take a chance on Jesus. You will never be sorry. On April the 14th, during the service, I'm going to be leading a new to Calvary class. And so those same guests or those people who have even been coming to Calvary for a little while, six months, it doesn't matter, a year, two years. Or you've come back recently and you don't even know who I am. I've been here four years and it's who is this pastor talking to me? I would love to meet you. I would love to talk about who we are as a community. What does it mean that we are under a Pentecostal umbrella? What do we believe about who God is? Do we care about our city? The answer is yes. And I will tell you why. Do we care about children and the next generation? Yes, we do very much, as you'll see in a few moments with an announcement that I have. But I would just love to help you learn about who we are. I would love to talk a little bit about who God has created you to be and encourage you to take some next steps. There's lots of great life-giving churches around Peterborough that may or may not be for you, but we may be for you. And if this is a community that you just want to grow closer to God in and make some deep, meaningful friendships along the way, then I want to help you get connected to this community here at Calvary. Speaking of next steps, after we make a decision to follow Jesus, to trust him, there's this next step that we do around here called water baptism. We baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And essentially summed up what this means is it's just simply a public declaration to your church family because you become family when you decide to follow Jesus. Everyone that you look around in this room is your brothers, your sisters, and we want to celebrate that decision that you have made. It doesn't mean that you know everything about the Bible. It doesn't mean you have everything in your life neatly, tidy, tied with a bow at all. It just means, hey, I'm putting my trust in Jesus, and then we declare that by the symbol of water baptism. If you want to learn more about what that is and if, and if it's the timing that is right for you to do that, next Sunday, just don't come in through these doors. Go down that hallway into our meeting space, and I'm going to be teaching about water baptism because on May 5th, we're having a baptism Sunday, and we already have, and I want Calvary, those of you who are family, to clap for this. We have already had 10 people express that they want to be baptized.
remain seated the entire plenary session of this special time of worship. In the beginning, God created the sun, moon, and stars, the animals, trees, and seas. He made us his own, and he gave us a garden. There was beauty and peace and life, but that wasn't enough, and so we sinned and we ate and we fell, and where there was once beauty and peace and life, there was now pain and chaos and death. We went from a garden to a grave. But God promised to bring us back, back from the grave into the garden. Days, weeks, years, generations of waiting for the promise, the promise to come back into the garden. For God so loved the world, he sent Jesus, friend of sinners, man of sorrows, Lord of glory and light of the world, rejected and refused, condemned and crucified, buried in a borrowed tomb, forsaken and forgotten. But three days later, he stepped out of his grave and into a garden. And the same is true for all who trust him. Where there is pain and chaos, and death. There will be beauty and peace and life because Jesus is alive. So is hope. So is grace. So is salvation. So is transformation. Because Jesus is alive, we can step out of our grave and into the garden.
the new creation has come. The old has gone, and the new is here.
system as we continue to bring this atmosphere of worship, thanking the Lord for just what he's been doing, the way that he's been victorious in people's lives, and all of the hope that we can find in the resurrection that we are celebrating today.
and let's give him the praise today. He is so good. in our honor today. Amen. 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 Why don't you turn to someone beautiful beside you and say, Happy Easter. So good to have you here in the house of the Lord. I'm telling you, it's not very often that I get caught off, caught surprised by how powerful the singing is across this whole auditorium. Not from the front, although that was amazing. Amen. Yeah, come on. But it was like a wave of singing that was going across here and then back here, and you could hear everyone singing the words together for multiple songs today because our spirit testifies doesn't it to the truth and the power of the resurrection of christ the fact that he was he died for our sins but he rose again and so he is worthy to be praised amen it's so good to be with you this easter sunday this is our first easter sunday at calvary anybody else had their first easter sunday at calvary you can raise your hands. That's all right. We're welcome. Can you welcome them? Yes, thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Michelle Mercer. My husband, Dwayne Mercer, in the front row here, and our two daughters, Hope and Michaela, and we moved here just in the, I guess we moved here in the fall, but we've been here since July, and so we're, we're experiencing all sorts of firsts at Calvary, and we are loving every moment of it. When we were here yesterday with all of the the kids and the eggs and just laughing at how aggressive they are when it comes to Easter eggs, um, but how cute they are at the same time. And then we were just, uh, just in awe on Good Friday as we watched this wonderful team uh, of staff and volunteers put together a, a communion service and, uh, and be able to see the reenactment of the, of the Last Supper, which was beautiful. Um, I just want to give a special thanks to Tyler and Arnisha because this is their first Easter leading the Creative Arts Department, so thank you. <laughs> We've appreciated all that they have done and, uh, and how they are fitting in so well, too. So we're just really excited uh, about what God has in store for us today. So we're going to open the Word. And if you're, if you're a keener and you want to get there first, you can go to John chapter 20. But first, I would love to tell you a little story. And a little story with a little illustration here for you because, you know, this is what I like to do at the beginning. So uh, when I was in primary school, probably like grade one or two, thanks, Tyler, um, I remember that we would do this science project where our teachers would give us a little plastic disposable cup and then uh, they would give us a paper towel, and we had to get the paper towel all wet. And then we'd be given a little lima bean of some sort or some kind of bean that would sprout really easily. We'd put it in there. We'd put our name on a little popsicle stick, and it would stick in the windowsill of the school classroom, and we would wait. When I was looking it up online, I saw, oh, they've... they've changed it to being Ziplocs, zippies, right? And they just put them on the windowsill and taped them there. And you'd wait to see what would happen. Sometimes you would run over to the window every, in the morning and you would check to see if anything has happened. Has there been a sprout, even something that's come alive? Other times you would just sit patiently and wait for someone else to tell you whether it came alive or not or something was happening. Other times you were sure it was just dead and useless, and why are we even involved in this science experiment at all? Some didn't care too much about what was happening, and others were eager to hear the report of what was true. And today, as I was thinking about this faith that was involved in even a small plant project in school as a primary student, 
I thought as well about the faith it takes to believe in the resurrection story. And whether it's really important if it's true. Follow with me for just a moment. There's a lot of people who believe in Jesus, that he did great things, important things, that his character, that his spirituality was worth following. They may may even believe that he died and was crucified a horrific death and that his followers grieved and mourned when he was put in a tomb. But how important is it that the resurrection part of our story is real? If the resurrection, if the resurrection story never happened, then it changes everything as believers in Jesus. The Apostle Paul, he says it like this in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, and if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead, but he did not raise him if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. So in other words, don't claim to believe in the God who raised Jesus from the dead if you don't believe it to be so that he was risen. Because the two go hand in hand. It's kind of like if you had like a two-story house, but you never decided to go to the second floor. What's the use of owning a house that has two levels if if you're only going to stay on the bottom level? Not only is it necessary to own the truth of the resurrection, there's also historical evidence to prove it. And this is the part that gets me excited. We often overlook that there's secular and Christian resources that prove that Christ indeed was crucified and resurrected on the third day. And the evidence of the resurrection of Christ, it's still worth noting. Some of the simple evidences include they never found the body of Jesus after the resurrection. It's documented in multiple secular writings that over 500, that's right, over 500 people saw the risen Christ. It wasn't like it was a long time before they, were, they had seen him last. I remember, remember Palm Sunday and everyone's coming to the streets to greet Jesus and then a f- few days later, suddenly they're saying crucify him. They remember what he looks like. And over 500 people, it was, it's been documented in secular writings, saw the risen Christ after the resurrection. Immediately following following Christ's resurrection and for centuries to come, people were willing to die because of this claim. Willing to die. And if you do a little research, which I know many of you have been doing, you'll see the case for Christ's resurrection as a historical event is so strong. It requires us then to make a decision about how the resurrection actually affects our lives. So here lies the tension. Knowing it's true and then embracing that it's true. And to do that, go from knowing to embracing takes faith. This leads us to today's passage of scripture. Do you know the other funny part about the part of the evidence that they have? You can look it up yourself. I hesitate to actually include it today, but I'm going to say it anyways. One part of the evidence, and I thought of it this morning too when I saw the women giving testimony of God's goodness, and then the men were giving testimony as well. But I thought of this funny fact that seems culturally inappropriate now, but the reason they know that the testimony of the resurrection was true was because it was first told to women. Now hold on for a moment. (laughs) 
The reason this part is, is quite interesting is because in those days, if uh, the Jewish followers of Jesus, Jesus, the disciples, if they were going to tell a story about the resurrected Christ, the last people on the earth they would have told were women. Some of you are going, I know. <laughs> Don't. <laughs> and the reason they wouldn't have told women was because culturally in that day, it was not even in a Jewish law, it would not be seen as evidence if a woman gave testimony of witness. It wasn't evidence, but God himself, Jesus himself, he entrusted the message of the good news to women first. Freeing it up so that the testimony of the good news of the resurrection could be shared to all people, to all nations, and that the disciples would come along and they would believe. And, and we're here in this passage right now. So understand this, that Jesus, re even revealing himself to the women at the tomb first, and for the story to stick in that time and age, and in ages to come, proof that the story of the resurrection is true. So let's read this story in John chapter 20. Here's the context. I love hearing from John the apostle because he's known as being one of Jesus' closest friends that are beloved. And, and don't you find it most intriguing to hear from someone who really knows another person, who really loves another person, uh, or, or here in the case of telling of their faith, someone who gives testimony, who is in love with Jesus, when they talk about Jesus, it's intriguing. It draws us in, it increases our own faith. And so John the Apostle, he tells the account of Jesus appearing first to the women at the tomb, telling them to go and tell the disciples what they've seen. The women run to the disciples, they give them the report, and then Jesus appeared to them within the walls of a locked house where they were hidden in fear of their lives of being associated with Jesus. And it leads us to verse 24 of chapter 20. It says, now Thomas, also known as did you miss one of the 12 was not with the disciples when Jesus came and so the other disciples told him we have seen the Lord now Jesus has appeared to them but he said Thomas he says unless I see the nails the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hands in his side I will not believe. A week later, turn to your neighbor and say a week later. Make sure they're still here. His disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Stop doubting and believe. And Thomas said to him, my Lord, my God. And then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would open the word to us today in a fresh way. Holy Spirit, I pray even now that you would work in our midst to help us to see the resurrection story with fresh eyes and to be full of faith. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I feel like more of us can relate to Thomas's doubts and insecurities than we'd like to admit. He says, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my fingers where those nails were, put my hand in his side, I will not believe. So the question I have for us is then, what does faith in the resurrection even look like? For both the unbeliever, the one who is seeking, who's considering, who's debating, contemplating, but also for those of us who do believe, who have faith, and have put our trust in him. And sometimes when we are grappling with, uh, to understand what faith is, it helps to be able to narrow down what it is not. And I have three points for us today 
And the first point is this, that faith is not an escape from reality. Faith is not an escape from reality. Thomas is in some ways recalling the trauma he experienced firsthand. Picture this, when they're saying, we've seen Jesus, you're not gonna believe it. We saw him in the flesh and he's not there and he hasn't seen it. And in his mind, he's instantly seeing a crucified Christ. Blood pouring from his hands, the palms of his hands. A pierced side, which was pierced after he had died to prove that he really was dead. And Thomas is reliving this trauma. In a way, he's saying, I saw it with my own eyes. He's dead. He's gone. Don't mess with my logic. Following Jesus as a believer is not a request to leave all your reasoning behind. Hear me today. It's not escaping from the reality we live in so that you can have your head up in the clouds all day long. What do they say? So heavenly minded that they're no earthly good. You know what I mean? <laughs> Faith is not an escape from reality. We need to allow God to move through our misconceptions of that. Doubting Thomas as he is known, he actually threw out s several times in, his in history and scriptures, he's mentioned as one who sincerely loved Jesus, in fact, and was willing to die with him. Thomas gets a bad rap, you know what I mean? He's considered the doubting Thomas. <laughs> But we have this account in John chapter 11 of Jesus and his disciples and, and they get word that their friend Lazarus is sick. You might recall the story, he was friends with this family and, and Lazarus is getting sick and his sisters say, go get Jesus, he can, he can prevent him from dying and, and Jesus chooses to wait a couple extra days during which time Lazarus does die. And Jesus announces to his team, we're gonna go back now towards Judea to see Lazarus and his family because he's asleep. And then they're like, well, what do you mean? You mean like he's just asleep now or he's gonna wake up? And he's like, no, he's dead. <laughs> and he explains them. It says in verse 14, he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead and for your sake, I am glad I was not there so that you may believe. Verse 16, but let us go to him. Then Thomas said to the rest of his disciples, this is what he says, let us also go that we may die with him. Now you can look at this multiple ways. <laughs> you could say it, let us all go, we're gonna die with him. Doubting Thomas, that's the way if you read back on it, you'd wanna say, right? Doubting Thomas, he's the realistic one, he's the logical one, just Follow Jesus, we're all gonna die now. We're going back to where they almost stoned him. But in fact, if you know the, the meaning of the original text, let us also go. There's this Greek word, ago, which gives this strong sense of leadership, that he was uh, leading them to a destination. He was actually showing leadership to the other disciples, saying Jesus said we're going, we're gonna go, and we might die, but we're following him. That's the faith that Thomas had. His personality was very realistic, very logical. He saw things a little black and white in the world. He, he knew though that he was called to follow Jesus and he followed him and so he had clarity about reality and potential for things going wrong but it didn't mean he wasn't seeking to follow Jesus and the will of God. And maybe that's some of you who have family members who you may have written off because of their doubts but in their hearts, they're just grappling with what they know and what they don't know, and they wanna stay grounded in reality, and yet they desire to have a faith. May I encourage you, your doubts shouldn't prevent you from having faith. Instead, like Thomas, it should propel you towards finding the answers for yourself from Jesus. It should push you forward. Because number two, faith 
requires action on our part. You see, faith isn't something that just happens to you. Some people are like, I just want that feeling of faith to rise up in me. I like the idea of Jesus. I've done the research about Jesus, but I I just want the feeling so that I'll be able to take the step of faith. Faith involves action. And this is what I love about Jesus. He doesn't write off Thomas because he hasn't seen him yet. No, instead, he makes another appearance. To the, excuse me, to the disciples, and he says to Thomas directly, Thomas, put your finger here, take action. See my hands, take a look. Reach out and feel my side. Touch the wound marks. There is a call from Jesus for all of us to move forward and take action because faith moves us towards the very things that we are afraid of confronting in the world and in our own life. It pushes us forward. I wanna encourage you today to embrace the reality of Christ's suffering, of our part in contributing to it. The Bible says all have sinned, every single person in this room and beyond, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But then when we embrace the gift that has been given to us by our move toward him and our confession of who he is, then we can experience faith because we have taken action moving towards salvation. Romans 10, it says this, The word is near you, it is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the message concerning faith that we proclaim. But verse nine says, if you declare with your mouth Jesus is is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Listen to this, for it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. And it is with your mouth, the action, that you profess your faith and are saved. See, it's not enough to just have it up here, this ideology, this idea of of liking the idea of Jesus, of, okay, believing it, yes, it's all up here, but there's something about the confessing with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, that act of faith. The Bible says, professing your faith that you are saved, and as scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. There is required action in all of our part. And Christ is the one who invites us to engage, not only in his suffering, but also embrace the power of the resurrection. You see, this this is the scripture that Paul is speaking to the church. So here's to the believers here today. I want you to think of this. Paul says in verse 18 of chapter one, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparable great power for us to believe. That power... Turn to someone and say, that power. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. This is the power of the resurrection that we all can experience. And the scriptures encourage us to embrace. But there's one more piece about faith and how to believe and why we need to believe in the resurrection. Faith involves believing without seeing at times. Faith involves believing without seeing. Thomas, when he saw Jesus, he said, my Lord and my God. I could just, I have had moments 
in service today, and I'm sure you have, where the tears have welled up in my eyes when we've recounted the time when we'll be face to face with Jesus in eternity. And I'm thinking, we will say those words as Thomas did in that moment, my God, my Lord, my God. And Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed, but blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. This is powerful. Jesus leaves that time and place. He's in, you know he's beyond time and space, right? And yeah, Jesus is there, but he's speaking to future generations after generations, and he looks to every decade, every century to come, and he says when people will believe the testimony of his resurrection without seeing me, those are the ones who will be truly blessed. Faith. As a child of seven years old, I believe the story a Sunday school teacher told me that Jesus was crucified, rose from the dead, because he loved me. And he wanted to spend eternity with me. And I knew it. I knew the resurrection power of Christ was true because it began to burn in my heart the truth of it. The love of it, I had never experienced anything like it, although I was a very loved child in a wonderful home with people who cared for me, but yet the truth that someone would die for me and be resurrected and call me to follow after him so that I would live in eternity with him and live a life of abundance here, the truth of that began to sprout in my heart. It took root. And everything in me in that moment wanted to say yes to Jesus. I know there's many of you here today who you can remember that moment like it was yesterday. But it took action, didn't it, to say yes. It took faith to believe even without seeing firsthand the resurrected Christ. I could think of even this moment with this science experiment as a child. Some were eager to believe the plant would grow. Others would come up to the window just for proof. Give me more proof that something's happening below the surface. Sometimes the teachers would let us unwrap a little bit so that we get a glimpse of the little things taking sprout. But at the end of the school day, we all had to go home, and we had to have faith that that plant was gonna grow. It would grow even if we couldn't see what was happening below the surface with our own eyes. And guess what? The plants, they did grow, most of them. A little at first and then bigger over time and the more they grew, then at that time we could transplant them into soil so that they'd really take root, that the roots that were already started and and then it would bloom even more and we would take them home with perhaps even the start of an actual bean. But thank goodness, we had put our little potting vessels in the windowsill right near the light. And I believe today, and I believe this in my spirit, and with this I'm gonna call up the worship team to come. I believe that God is putting you in the light of his word this morning to grow your faith to believe. I believe it with all my heart. He's putting you in the light of his word today, this Easter, to grow your faith. Maybe because you've never believed before and today you want to believe. Maybe it's because you believed long ago, but you've neglected that part of your life. And he's saying, I believe in second chances. I believe that there's a purpose for your life even today. 
And what you don't know, and what we didn't know back then either, was this, that the teacher was secretly putting water on the dry pots that were sitting near the windowsill. Especially after a long weekend, when no one was watering them at all. And she would come by and she would just put a little bit of water in there to help it to grow. I'm telling you right now, if you're here today, the Holy Spirit's been watering your soul and spirit for this moment for a long time. This moment of salvation for you too, and my request would be, would you say yes? Say yes to this desire he has to bring you from being buried and dead in sin to having new life in him. Would you take a step, even as a believer today, those who believe in Jesus and have received him as your Lord and Savior, would you take a step towards a fuller embrace of what it means to have the resurrected power of Christ alive in you? That means you can say no to sin and the things that used to entrap you. That means you can walk a life of victory. That means you can have faith and hope and peace in the, in the most difficult of circumstances. That means you can give your testimony. Even though the doctors say that there is no hope, the Lord knows today we could use a better understanding of the resurrected power of Christ alive and at work within us as believers. I think it's interesting because this scripture is where I want to close today. And it's the same message that we actually gave at Christmas Eve. And it was the message that, message that Jesus said, I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly. Do you have faith to believe that today? You do? Let's bow our heads together just as the worship team plays. Jesus, thank you so much that you love each and every person who's here in this room. There's not one person in this room that you did not give up your life for. While you were on the cross, we were on your mind, Lord Jesus. What a profound thought. Whether you're seven years old or 77 years old or 107 years old, this truth remains. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Why? Because Jesus conquered death, because he overcame the grave, because the tomb has been rolled away and the proof is beyond all evidence. He is alive and that life came to conquer death and sin in your life as well. Would you receive him today? Well, every eye's bowed and no one's looking around in this private moment between you and God. If you've not received Christ as your Lord and Savior or you need to come back and receive him once again, would you just raise your hand to God the Father? Acknowledge just between you and God that you've received Christ as your Lord and Savior and that you wanna live your life for him. Just raise your hand, I can see that hand one there, one in the back over here, two, three, four. I'm looking, help me out any ushers if you are able to see anybody in the dark. Praise the Lord, thank you for your faith today. In the front up here, I see another hand raised. Anyone else want to see? This is, today is the day of salvation. Don't let another Easter go by without receiving what he has for you. Yep, another hand over there. Thank you. Praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for faith. Let faith arise in this room. Amen. I see your hand over here on the right side, my right, your left. Thank you, Jesus takes faith to believe. Jesus said, like a little child, become like a child and have the faith of a child to believe. There's things we'll never figure out this side of eternity, but he'll, he'll, rem he'll remind us of this moment in time. When he asked us to have the faith to believe without seeing, and didn't tell us to leave our reasoning at the door, but he said to make all things subject to him, 
and surrender to the will of God in our lives. One more chance, if there's anyone else who'd like to raise their hand who hasn't done so, receive Christ. We're not gonna embarrass you at all. We just wanna pray over you. Anybody else? Amen, thank you, sister. Amen, amen. Why don't we all stand together if you're able. Let's pray together. Jesus, thank you (laughs) for those who have raised their hand to receive you as their Lord and Savior. So God, I pray, even as we all remind ourselves of this, the moment of salvation, that time when we received Christ as our Savior, let's pray this prayer together with, in light of the brothers and sisters who want to receive Christ. It's, there's no magic formula. The Bible said it, we read it. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and that God raised him from the dead, then you shall be saved. And so let's pray this together. Dear Jesus, Thank you for dying on the cross. Thank you for redeeming my life and forgiving me of my sins. I confess my need for you today and I receive you as my Lord and Savior. Help me to live my life for you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Can you give the Lord a great big hand? He's a good God. He's a good God. Okay. We didn't want anyone to leave empty handed. So, uh, Dwayne, would you just grab me that little package of seeds here? We've got something special for you. There's been a whole crew behind the scenes making sure this happens. There's seeds right here. They're not lima bean seeds. They're beautiful wildflowers because we believe that God makes all things beautiful in his time and spring is coming. And so we want you to take home this package with you today as a reminder of all that God has done, that he's brought your life from death to life in him in abundance. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's celebrate one more song together. God bless you.
Amen. We hope you have a wonderful Easter. If you are new to Christ, we have a special Bible for you. You can get it at the welcome desk. Don't forget to take home your seeds and have a wonderful week. May God bless you. Happy Easter.